Good afternoon. Thank you guys so much for being patient with us here today. My name is Peter Hartz. I'm manager of career services here at GIA. I'd first like to start by welcoming everybody here in the audience, all of our students, alumni, and staff members. Additionally, I would like to give a special welcome to all of those participating in our Facebook live stream here today. And I would like to ask for those of you in the audience, as well as, as, well as those of you watching on Facebook Live, please hold all of your questions till the end of the presentation. And feel free for everybody on Facebook to submit the questions. When we have time after the audience, we will go ahead and give those to our speakers. For those of you that have joined us in the past, as you know, each month we host this series with the hopes to enhance your professional and educational development. For this month's series, we're going to be focusing on marketing and brand strategy in the jewelry industry. And today, we're very thrilled to welcome two experienced professionals that have more than 30 years of experience in this field. Our first speaker is Nikki Austin. She has 20 years of marketing experience in the jewelry industry. Her expertise includes media coverage, product placement, and marketing events. She's worked with more than 50 jewelry and watch companies her clients have been featured in major media outlets, ranging from E! News to the Wall Street Journal. She's also had her clients featured on celebrities for the biggest red carpet events, including the Golden Globes, Emmy Awards, and the Academy Awards as well. <clears throat> Prior to this, Nikki had worked a decade in public relations as, and with top-ranking companies such as Clifford PR, Euro RS, CG Magnet, and Fox. She holds a bachelor's degree of arts in English and cultural studies from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. She also received a certificate from UCLA in film, TV, video, and new media with an emphasis on entertainment publicity. Nikki is a member of the Women's Jewelry Association and a voting member of the Academy of Television and Arts and Sciences. For our second speaker, we'd like to welcome Jen Cullen Williams. Jen Cullen Williams is a dynamic, award-winning brands communication consultant. She specializes in jewelry, luxury, fashion, and consumer goods markets. She's known throughout our industry for her deep-rooted relationships with editors, journalists, stylists, influencers, and industry professionals. She has had countless press placements with leading media outlets such as Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Elle, Pop Sugar, as well as placements in television and film and celebrities and also digital media influencers. She's worked with large established companies as well as emerging smaller brands. Some of her clients include <clears throat> Ben Bridge, Shariol, American Gem Society, Gem Water, Engagement 101 Magazine, JCK Events, Jewelers Mutual Insurance, Richline Group, and many others. She holds a bachelor's degree in fashion merchandising and business entrepreneurship from California State University, Long Beach. She also holds an executive education certificate in global leadership from the Harvard Business School. Currently, she is serving as the Western Regional Director of the Executive National Board of the Women's Jewelers Association and is the past president of the WJA Los Angeles chapter. Jen is the winner of the WJA Awards for Excellence in the category of Marketing and Communications in 2016 and the recipient of the first ever Rising Star Award presented by the Jewelers 24 Karat Club of Southern California. Please help me welcome to the stage Jen Cullen Williams and Nikki Austin. go. Well, um, thank you so much, Peter, for that intro. I 
feel like I need you to come to my house every morning and get me hyped up for the day. <laughs> me too. Um, it's amazing. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, we and thank you for our Facebook livers. Um, one may be my mom. Um, we'll see if she can figure out the technology to do it. Um, anywho, thank you um, to the GIA team um, and staff for inviting us to speak. It's really quite an honor and it feels um, really special to us because we're sort of like on the other side of the business and we don't always, um, we've you know done a lot of different things in our career so it's fun to kind of come back and, and spend time. So um, I'm Jen, that's Nikki. Um, we're gonna tell you a little bit more about ourselves. Um, today we're gonna talk about Marketing 101. It, marketing encompasses so many things. So what we kind of looked at it um, when we were putting together this presentation, what we thought was let's do a little bit on personal marketing and then also business marketing. So if you have a business or you're working for a business, um, what that entails. And then um, as Peter mentioned, we'll have Q&A from the live audience and the digital audience, if there is one. Um, and, um, and hopefully you know, you'll walk away with a lot of takeaways that you can um, you know, put towards your journey and your career. Um, so we just wanted to get a little kind of pulse on the audience and see where everyone is at. So our, who is, here is a student? Mostly, that's what Mostly students, all Mostly right. Students. How many are alumni? Oh, all right, good. okay, I thanks for coming. Um, how many are faculty? Okay, nice and then staff. Awesome. <laughs> so we've got a little bit. How about other? Is there a some Other. Others? Oh, there's oh, we others. Got there we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the other thing we wanted, we we're just curious, is um, who is really in it for the gemology side, laboratory studies? So how about design, design side? Jewelry designer. That's it. And then jewelry business, just in general. Huh? Okay. So we've got, we've got, well, I guess everyone can put your hands up for that, but um, so we have a really great uh, mix and, and um, a diverse group, so welcome and thank you for having us here. Um, I'm going to let Nikki tell you a little bit about herself. So yeah. funny, when I look at this picture, it just looks so funny and a long time ago. So hi again, I'm Nikki. Uh, as Peter mentioned, I grew up in Montreal, Canada. I went to McGill University. Um, and I graduated with a degree in English Cultural Studies, which is basically like philosophy, but I, I really had no idea what I wanted to do as a career. So there's my graduation photo, and at that point, all I knew is that I needed to get to L.A. I needed to be in L.A., but I had no clue what was I going to do. So during school at McGill, during the summers, I would take classes in L.A. at UCLA, where I would take courses in entertainment, all, all about the entertainment industry. So I would have amazing guest speakers that I would listen to, I would ask them a lot of questions, and I knew I wanted to do something in entertainment, I wanted to be in LA. The class that I took at UCLA required me to get an internship. So this is before, this is 20 years ago, before the internet was really where it is today. I had to look in the yellow pages to find an internship. I didn't even know what an internship was. So I turned through the yellow pages, I came across Fox Broadcasting Company. And being from Canada, we didn't even have Fox there, so I said, oh, Fox Broadcasting Company, it sounds like it's a television station, I'm going to give them a call. So I called the operator, the operator transferred me to the PR department, and basically that's how I started my career in PR. I got an internship um, in the Fox TV publicity department, where I started helping out with everything and anything they needed me to help them with related to the television show. So I worked on all these like super cool shows like 90210 and Melrose Place as an intern, I would get to go to all these red carpet events. I would meet with all the talent. I mean, it seemed very glamorous, but it was a lot of work. And I knew from that point on that I still wanted to do something in entertainment, but I didn't really know what. So the following summer when I was at McGill, I came back to LA, I did another internship. This time it was at King World Productions, which was a tabloid production company where I worked um, on two television shows that were tabloid. This time I was they put me on the red carpet interviewing celebrities and trying to ask them questions at movie premieres and TV premieres and such. So I had a really great two years of internships and then I graduated and I moved out to LA by myself, no connections aside from the connections that I met during my internships. 
I kept in touch with Fox. Um, my boss is at Fox. And I don't know how, miraculously, I, I thank them so much because they gave me a job in the publicity department again. I was the assistant to the VP of PR, and that's my, I think, on my first day of the job, like 20 years ago, <laughs> with my boss, who was amazing back then at Fox. And she so, has not aged, I by have. the way. Thank, thank you, Jen. <laughs> um, so I worked at Fox for two years, and I really learned everything and anything there is to know about entertainment, publicity, and television. I had an amazing boss who really allowed me to participate in every single aspect of the business. I mean, this includes answering, just answering phones with all the executives calling and then going to all the different events. At the same time, I signed up for a degree at UCLA Extension in Entertainment Publicity, so I was working all day, going to school at night, and doing events on the weekend. Um, I also, at this point, at UCLA met an amazing mentor. His name is Dan Duran, and he worked at ABC Television, and he let me accompany him to go to all the TV tapings of his shows that he was working on and learning all the production behind the scenes in television. So after about two years at Fox, I learned a ton. I moved on to a lifestyle, consumer lifestyle public relations agency in L.A., um, called Maggot Communications, and it was there that I started my career in jewelry PR. So what happened was a client, now a client, came in, Platinum Guild International, and they're the jewelry association for the, the platinum uh, industry. And we won the business somehow, and <laughs> kicked back to, take it to 20 years later, and they're still my client 20 years later. Um, I'm so grateful. They've become like family to me, and because of Platinum Guild, I was able to meet so many incredible designers. I work with some of the top fashion houses, which I'm still, jewelry fashion houses, which I'm still working with today. Um, and then I met so many cool emerging jewelry brands. Um, and since then, I worked at Magnet Communications for five years. Then I switched to another PR agency called Clifford PR. And uh, in 2008, I just took the leap and I started my own company, PR Lab. I had one client. Platinum Guild, they came with me, <laughs> and um, I started working in jewelry PR, and since then, I've counted, I mean, I, I know I worked with over 50 jewelry brands, but yesterday I counted, and I have over 100 jewelry brands that I've worked with over the past 20 years of my career, um, and that's basically my journey from school until now, and Jen? All right, so um, I think Peter said it all, so I don't think, no, it's <laughs> So I was a pretty creative kid. I liked performing. Um, I danced, and I was always like really hyper. And now I have a young daughter who is exactly the same way. So I um, knew I needed something creative, but I liked. I had also really kind of type A organizational side to me. So I thought I wanted to be a film producer, and I went to school, um, Cal State Long Beach to get a film degree, and then I took a couple film classes and I was like, oh, this isn't for me anymore. So I switched my major to fashion merchandising and then got a minor in business entrepreneurship, and I wanted to learn everything, and so I started doing internships. So I did one at, my first one was at a shoe wear company called Volatile. Um, they made like basically knockoff rocket dogs, if anyone remembers what rocket dogs are. Um, and I was in the quality control and kind of working with the sales team. And I thought maybe I wanted to be a sales rep. And then I did another internship in visual merchandising because at the same time I was working retail at Victoria's Secret. And I had just been promoted to a visual merchandising um, assistant. And I thought, oh, I want to do corporate visual merchandising. So then I did my internship at BCBG, um, the clothing fashion company. And I realized, oh, I don't want to do that. So I kept thinking, like, what do I want to do? And while I was at BCBG, I kept seeing these really stylish, um, well, I also thought buying, but then I saw what the buying department looked like, which was like all spreadsheets and numbers, and I was like, ooh, that doesn't look like fun. So when I would see these marketing girls, um, or women, and then they were you know, toting around, and they were doing photo shoots, and they were putting together like a lot of the creative, and I thought, that's what I wanna do, something in marketing, but I just didn't really know, and like Nikki was saying, it was pre-social media, so, I had my reference point to what marketing and PR was, was The Hills, which is a show back then that's doing a little reboot. Um, and so, they, so they, they kept using the word PR, I didn't know what that was, so I looked for internships in PR, and I got one at 
a fashion PR um, company in Hollywood called Red Light PR. And I was doing that my, and that was my final semester of school. And um, I was actually really fortunate. There was 15 interns and I actually got hired while I was still in school. So I was working part time, living in Orange County, going up to uh, LA three days a week to work. And it was crazy, taking 21 units, it was insane. Um, but it really taught me a lot of juggling, managing. Um, and I worked there for a few months and I had a full-time job when I graduated in 2007. It was right before the recession. And I worked there, but it was the Devil Wars Prada style, rolling racks, the, you know, getting yelled at, stylists. It was kind of the heyday of like clubs and celebrities going, paparazzi and all that fun stuff. So um, from there I went to, um, I, I was looking for jobs and I looked on uh, Craigslist and I found a position for a luxury PR agency and it was called Luxury Brand Group and I applied and I got a marketing assistant position and it was based in Orange County which was great because it narrowed my commute a lot but the two uh, founders of the, the um, Luxury Brand Group were actually from Platinum Guild so they actually knew That's Nikki. how we met. So that's how we first got introduced. Um, and so I started you know, very junior and green. I remember coming here for career fair and my boss was actually a presenter and I stood in the back and she kept like calling me out and making me like say things in the back. I was like, I don't know. Um, but I um, you know, really got entrenched within the jewelry market. So I have uh, been with the agency for over 12 years and then recently, I'm actually still with the agency um, consulting, and then I'm also now on my own doing um, my own consulting projects. Um, and that's like recently, as of like August 1st, officially. So um, I've just been in the PR sector for a really long time, and I really love the jewelry industry. So I know Peter mentioned a lot of the brands I've worked with, but you've probably heard of the JCK. Um, trade show that takes place, I work with JCK, and a handful of other designers, retailers, uh, manufacturers, and um, it's really fun and there's a lot of change happening and so we're hoping to give you some best practices and things um, both for yourself but also from a business standpoint. Um, and then just to, for reference, this is a picture, I made a resume when I was like, I think I was like 11 because I wanted to be an actress and so I made my mom take me to a local <laughs> studio and that was my headshot. Um, it still works. It still works, yeah. Um, there's like other ones with hats. Um, and then the middle one is actually, um, I don't know if you follow Gem Gossip. She's a influencer. She's one of my good friends. Um, she's an alumni from here. And um, so that was just like a fun one. And then this is actually Catherine Kimmel, which you may know, who's very, very high up in the marketing side of GIA. Um, and that was 10 years ago. And she, she's been uh, a very great mentor to me, so I wanted to make sure to include her. So I'm gonna turn it over to Nikki. Okay. So we wanna jump right in then with marketing tips on how you can establish yourself as a marketer and also if you're going into marketing the business side. Um, first of all, networking and internships cannot stress this enough, especially nowadays. You don't have to go out to network. You can network from your laptop or your mobile device because you can DM people, you can email people, so you should consistently be networking with anyone and everyone because you never know who can help you. Um, in terms of also going to events, speaking opportunities, um, Jen had mentioned JCK, the Women's Jewelry Association. There are so many different networking organizations like Create and Cultivate, Girl Boss. I mean, you literally just need to Google networking organizations in your local community and you'll find a ton. Um, so I definitely stress you go to networking events too if you, can't, um, if you can. Um, sometimes I find these networking events can be intimidating because there's so many people there and you're like, oh my God, how can I meet so many people at one time? So for me, I just go with the intention of meeting one new person that night. That way it calms me down and I'm like not so intimidated. Um, so that's just a thought. And then internships. You heard me mention I had a couple of internships. I totally worked for free. I don't know if nowadays people still do that. Um, but I worked for two summers for free just so I can learn about the business side of things. Um, you can also learn what you love in an internship and you can learn what you don't love. 
in an internship. So I highly recommend taking a couple of internships. They don't have to be huge time commitments. You can do it for a couple of months um, just to get your, your feet wet and learn what you love to do and what you don't love to do. Um, and also, I would say, sorry to yeah, interject, go, go. I would say um, you can also do shadow, sh shadow shifts. So you could spend like a couple days, so maybe it's not a full-fledged you know, internship that three month commitment, right. but just you know, asking a professional, hey, could I shadow you for a day? A lot of professionals would say yes, so that you can kind of understand what their day-to-day -day is, because that's always tricky to know if that day-to-day -day is gonna be something that's gonna fit who you are and you know your culture, but I think it's really really important to take those opportunities. And um, you know, GIA does a really incredible job of bringing a lot of professionals. So always ask, and you never know. And if if not, if they say I can't do a shadow, but if you want to send me a couple questions, there's a good chance that they'll write back. So that's just something to to take away. <laughs> um, and then relationship building. It's super important in my business as well, in the marketing side, to constantly be out there building relationships with people. And for us, it would be the media, stylists, celebrities, social media influencers. So really anyone in your world um, that will help you get ahead and market yourself. For me too, I also like to build relationships between my clients. So we can have two jewelry designers collaborating together on a project or a jewelry designer collaborating with a handbag designer, eyewear designer, really bringing people together. I think that very much helps as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, in this room also, you can look around and see who in this room can actually help you build your business. Um, you guys should be networking too after this, <laughs> this presentation as well. Um, and then we wanted to bring up too, identifying toxic situations because just like there are really great relationships, there's also toxic relationships, and you should be aware of those in your business, especially as you're growing your business. And even, you know, when you first start out, you don't really know who's really there to help you and who's not. You don't want someone to take advantage of you. Um, so in our world, in the marketing agency world, there's, uh, there's been situations that I've learned from in the past, for example, where we'll have, we'd have clients that didn't really understand, or we, they couldn't really understand what PR was, and they thought, okay, they get a press, you know, they get a celebrity wearing their necklace, or they get a placement in Vogue, and automatically their sales are going to increase. And so when we tell them, no, that's not really how it goes, they get disappointed. And so now we've learned to say no and kind of manage expectations. But you should really think about making sure that people don't take advantage of you when you're first starting out your business, that you have a good group of people around you, a good community. I think it's really important. Um, and mentoring. I mentioned as well, I have an amazing mentor who's still my mentor today. Um, but you should really try to get a mentor. And this might seem like a really strange request, but there's so many ways to do it nowadays. Like I said, virtually through DMs and through emailing, you can send a couple of DMs to people that you admire. These could be GIA faculty, staff. It could be um, entrepreneurs that you admire. It doesn't have to be just in the jewelry world but you can send them an email with a couple of questions or ask them if you can get on a phone call for a couple of minutes. And be very specific with your emails um, and your questions. Don't make them generic. Really make them want to respond to you so that way you get a couple minutes of, of their time. And you'd be surprised. You can email people who are pretty high level individuals and they'll respond to you if you're very specific and you show passion in your emails or DMs. Um, I also suggest when you're getting on the phone with one of these people that you could potentially be your mentor, or you're sending an email, at the end of the email or phone call, you might want to ask them, who else can I talk to that could help me? Is there someone else that you know, a contact of yours that you can introduce me to? Because you never know who they know, who knows someone, who knows someone. And that's kind of the idea of how it works. Um, and then continued education, even if it's not in the jewelry industry, so, you know, with the rise of social media, for example, everything has changed the landscape. It has all changed the landscape of marketing. So one new social media platform could pop up overnight, as you guys know, and it could completely change how we run our business, how you're, you're going to run your businesses. So it's really important to stay on top of the latest marketing trends, whether that's taking classes online or in person. Um, but really making sure that you're not falling behind. And for, for me, because I'm in my car so much, I drive a lot from LA, San Diego, 
Uh, I listen to a ton of podcasts about marketing and business and PR. So that's one way to do it if you don't really have time to take some classes. Um, and following through and hustling. In our business, we're constantly hearing no's. No, we don't, you don't, ha we don't have the budget to hire you right now. Or no, you're, you know, your cost is too high. Or no, we can't do this event. Or no, we won't cover your client. Or no, we don't like their jewelry. Or just silence. They don't respond back to our emails requesting coverage. So we've kind of learned, I think you have to in, the, in whatever business you're in, to just take the no's and roll with it. And don't even think about it and just keep going until you get a yes because you will get a yes if you're truly passionate about what you're doing and you truly believe in your product and you're out there doing your thing you will get a yes so you just have to hang in there perfect so I am going to switch it up and I'm going to come to the other side so I can read that one nope you can't read it we gotta make bigger um, so I'm here to talk about personal and professional marketing. So basically how do you market both yourself and a business? The one thing that people think is that there's one surefire, this is a strategy and this is going to work. And it's like every individual, like every gemstone, everything is rare, unique and beautiful and has its own characteristics. So you have to adapt and create a plan or a cutting technique that's gonna work for that particular thing. So um, defining your personal brand, the one thing you have to define, mostly on a business side, but also for yourself, is the purpose. So what is your purpose? Why, what is your why? Why, if you're going to create uh, your own line, why do you wanna create your own line? And then you also have to think about what is your mission? So if you, your why, but now what are you going to give? What is your value proposition to the consumer, to the world? What are you going to give? What are you providing? Um, what service is that? So it's really thinking about that. And sometimes it's, you know, yes, if you have a business, it's easier to think about what a mission is. But if you're, in a, you're looking to be an appraiser or a, uh, working in the laboratory, what makes you unique and special in order for you to stand out and do and perform your job well. So that's sort of like what to think about from both the professional and personal side. Um, and then thinking, crafting your story. What is your story? And kind of thinking the elevator pitch of your story. So um, you probably heard the term elevator pitch, but that's basically just being able to quickly say what you do. I know for Nikki and I, so we do PR. And you may actually, in the audience, not really know, you hear the word PR or public relations, but you don't even really know what it is. Um, so when someone asks me, like, what do you do? It's, you know, a lot of people think I do jewelry sales. I'm like, I don't sell jewelry. I actually don't physically take money for jewelry sales. But what I do is I help to make a brand have exposure in the market and try to reach their customer. So PR is just a form of communication. So it means public relations, it means your outward message, um, but it can mean a lot of different things. And it can get coupled with words like advertising and marketing and it, all of those words jumbled together. But essentially, and I don't know if we have time to go through all of them, but from PR, it's really your way of connecting with the outside world and the message you wanna put there. So that's why you need to have your purpose and mission. Um, also have your bio, so that's part of your story. Um, you just never know, like we had our bios read today, which is like really weird to hear it orally uh, from someone else, but, um, cause I normally just like, you know, read it and send it. But it's really important for, as a company, you know, to create a bio. Um, and if your company has different different elements to it. So say you have one division that's doing this and another division that's doing this and something else. Um, you want to make sure that you have little mini bios for all of them and then one overarching bio. So I can't stress it enough. Get your bio ready. Also get your headshot. Um, you saw Nikki and I had some headshots. You can, now our, our phones are so amazing that you can definitely get a headshot you know, done with your phone on a white wall. Um, or outside is always good with good lighting. Um, but it's really important because you just never know when an opportunity, especially if the media wants to do something, they will ask for a headshot or a shot of you doing what you do. 
So I just think that's important from a personal branding perspective. If, if you work for a company, you want to have photos that could be ready for the press at any time. The other thing is you want to build a community and that's your audience. So that kind of takes us into how to market yourself. Well, you have to identify who is your customer, who is your audience, who are you trying to sell to, who are you trying to reach. Um, that is probably one of the most important things just in the base, basis of any business besides your why is who. <laughs> so why do you have your why and who is going to receive that why? Um, I, a lot of companies, I'll ask them, I'll say, so who's your customer? They're like, well, every woman. Well, every woman isn't really your customer because every woman isn't buying your brand. So narrowing down and figuring out like who that target audience is, is really important. From a personal perspective, understanding and identifying your audience is, well, if you're trying to get a job, who is the company that you're trying to go for? If you're trying to go for a really cool, edgy, brand new, disruptor, technology-based company, then maybe the way that you present and the way that you put together your resume is gonna be reflective of that company and their culture and if that's a good fit for you. But if you're gonna go somewhere that's more corporate and more um, policy-driven and a little bit more by the books, then you may wanna have you know, a resume and a presentation or portfolio that's more adapted to that. So really just thinking about like what your purpose is, but then also who you want to receive that purpose and how can you market to them. So with that, it's also, when you think of your audience, how do they consume? So taking it to a business side, um, if your consumer is you want to reach 25 to 35 year olds, sort of the millennial um, technology savvy, um, you know, Instagram loving, um, social media, you know, connectors, experiential type of consumer, then you need to make sure that your brand has those elements incorporated into your marketing structure. If you are trying to do more private and more very luxury and very niche market, then you need to figure out how do you tap into that audience. Is it, do you need to join a Facebook group for you know, because there's probably a Facebook group for everything, like moms that love jewelry with beads and amethyst. Like there might be a Facebook group for that, I don't know, but looking for those niche audiences and identifying that and how do you reach them and how do they consume um, is really important. And then connecting with them and just establishing your marketing channels, that could be through social media. And that's a, that's a question I get a lot of like, I have, I have my own business, how, how should I market? That is the that question is basically I have a diamond ring. How much does it cost? Well, what kind of metal? What kind of diamonds? What kind of you know? Like there's a million things that you would need to ask in order to to pinpoint what it is. So from you know a marketing channel, what's going to work for you? I can tell you you know I've worked with big corporate brands, so their strategy is they have certain things in their strategy which usually is pretty robust. It's including social media. It's including mm -hmm paid advertising, it's including digital advertising, events, trade shows, like all kinds of basically all like a full comprehensive. Then I've worked with more independent designers. They're not looking for mass, they're not looking for scale, they're really looking for the right customer. So for them, it's targeted, you know, social media advertising, it's um, doing pop-ups with other like-minded brands and doing collaborations to reach you know, similar audiences that like the same thing. So just thinking about, you know, what your strategy for your business or for your brand, um, you know, and depending on, to take it now to kind of flip to the personal side, when you're thinking about what your marketing plan is for yourself, especially when you're going out into the job market, think about uh, how do you want to reach the company? So the company that you want to say work for, like you have a dream company, you know, I, Nikki was yours, yours was Fox. If, it, you know, whatever it is, follow them on Instagram. Maybe if they have events for the public, go to them because you never know who you'll meet. Um, reach out to them, DM them is even a possibility, obviously. Do an internship. In <laughs> internship is a Get great a way. A mentor. <laughs> um, so connecting with, mm -hmm. you know, your target goal is really, really important. Um, and so, you know, just thinking about that in advance, especially while you're in school, because this is the time that you have. I mean, I know you're busy because you're 
you know, doing your thing. But you also, this is a great time to get these like elements in order. So I am going to turn it over to Nikki to Marketing okay. 101. Should I stand here now since you stood there? Yeah. Okay. So really before we get into the nitty gritty of the entire marketing campaign and what it can involve, I think it's important to look at what is PR? What was it today versus 20 years ago when I first started in the business? So PR basically is getting, like Jen mentioned, awareness for your brand. And traditional PR is really free publicity. It's unpaid, unlike advertising, which is marketing, where you pay to get a placement. But as we know, since the rise of social and digital media and the decline of traditional advertising and magazines, which are almost non-existent nowadays, there's really the line between PR and marketing has blurred. So PR now includes marketing, and it includes both paid and unpaid opportunities that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but this can really take your brand to the next level. So you can keep all of these ideas in mind. Don't get overwhelmed because you don't need to do all of it. It's important to remember that. But at least you'll have sort of a, a few little points to keep in mind as your company grows. Um, and so you obviously might wonder, well, why is one jewelry company getting so much exposure when your jewelry line, for example, you know the quality is better um, and you know your price point might be better? Um, most of this has to do with marketing, how you're marketing your product, what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, or are you doing any marketing? And so here are some of the components of an effective marketing campaign nowadays. Um, first, media relations. So media relations is what we call traditional PR. It's what I just referred to as free publicity. So you're not paying uh, any of the media outlets to talk about your product. Basically what you would do is you would write a pitch. When I say you, I mean you or your marketing professional, but I'm using you guys in this case since you might be doing the marketing work <laughs> in the beginning. Um, so you would write a pitch, which is basically the story of your line, who you are, what makes you unique and special. You would develop a targeted list of the media outlets that you want to go after. So if they're Vogue, um, depending on obviously what your product is, GQ, any of the like high snobiety, high beast, whatever it is, whoever you're wanting to reach, you make sure your, your targeted media outlets are there. You'd find the editors of these specific publications and you basically send them your information via email and they would write about you. So that being said, it seems super easy, right? Like you send them the stuff and they write about you, but it's definitely not nowadays, especially in today's day and age if you're not paying for any type of marketing to coincide with your outreach. So here are some tips that I've been doing lately in order to get press for my clients um, if they don't have big budgets to pay for anything. The first thing is I offer an exclusive to one media outlet. So I'll pick one media outlet that's really important and very targeted. So if I'm launching, for example, here's, a, here's an example. The Women's Wear Daily piece with Platinum Guild. We're doing a collaboration with a celebrity wardrobe stylist, Michaela Erlinger, and we're launching a jewelry collection with her. So instead of going wide to every single media outlet out there, I picked one that was important, which was Women's Wear Daily. And I went to a writer there, and I said to her, I'm going to give you this exclusive on this launch. I'm not telling anyone else. I'm not posting on social media. But I need to know if you're interested in it, and I need to know soon before I send it wide. And fortunately, the writer said, yes, I'm interested. I'd like to do an interview. So I gave an exclusive interview to Women's Wear Daily, and then the story ran the next day or two days later. So that's kind of one way to work it, work it if you have an exclusive. Another thing to consider, if you can offer a writer, an editor, a really interesting experience that they couldn't get on their own. So if you're a designer, for example, you can invite this editor to come to your studio, let them make a custom piece, you show them how, how to work the, the bench, what, what it is that you're doing, how you set the diamond. If they're involved in the process and they get some sort of exclusivity, chances are they're gonna wanna write about your client or about you. Um, so that's something else to consider. And then also, another way to position yourself is as an expert. You guys are studying at the GIA, so you are experts in your field, and you will be when you graduate. So if you position yourself as an expert to the media, then chances are they're going to call you every time there's an opportunity for you guys to be quoted in a publication. Now this might mean that your product itself won't be featured, but your name and your company will. So for example, I have uh, many of my jewelry clients 
Um, I position them as experts to the press when it comes to celebrity engagements and weddings. So when a celebrity gets engaged, the media now, they know to send me a picture of the ring that's usually posted now on Instagram within minutes, and I get my client to comment on the ring, the description, um, the trend, how much it might cost, and then they get quoted and it runs everywhere in a variety of syndicated media outlets. So that's something else, is make sure you position yourself as an expert in the field. Um, and then also integrated content is something that you can, should think about when you're talking about a comprehensive marketing campaign. And what that means, instead of selling traditional advertising like they did, uh, magazines had their sales reps. Nowadays, a lot of sales reps are called branded, integrated content manager or brand director. And what that means is their role is really to integrate your product organically into their media outlet so that it reads like an editorial, but really it's paid. And unlike regular PR, which you're not paying for, so you don't have any control over what the story is going to say, if it's going to be positive or negative, when you're doing integrated content, you have absolute control because you're paying for it. So you can say when you want this piece to run, what you want it to look like, what photo you want to have featured. So it's something else if you have a smaller marketing budget to consider. And then influencer marketing, which you guys probably know a lot about, is basically working with in social media influencers or celebrities or musicians or models and actors and actresses. And it's creating a targeted list of these influencers that would be appealing for your brand and reaching out to their representatives. So you basically tell them, I've got this amazing jewelry collection. Uh, I would like so-and-so to wear this piece and you would pay them to wear the piece. Now you might say, okay, there's opportunities for unpaid. You can just gift a piece of jewelry and not have to pay them. And that could work sometimes, but nowadays a lot of these social media influencers, as you guys know, this is how they make their living. So they wanna get paid. And so you're going through agents and managers and all these different people, um, and so you end up having to pay them. The key thing to remember is if you do have contacts in the influencer world and they're willing to do something unpaid, don't expect anything in return. I've had situations where jewelry designers would send influencers piece, really expensive pieces of jewelry because the influencer said, oh, I'm gonna take a photo, I'm gonna post it on my Instagram, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna tag you guys, I'm gonna do a video on my Insta stories, and it never happens. And then you know they lose out because it, obviously it's your hard work um, and it's very expensive. So I would just caution you against these unpaid opportunities where you're expecting something in return from them. Um, and then another option, let's say you just don't have the money for any kind of guaranteed product placement. What you can do is you prepare a lookbook with all of your pieces and you can send it out to the wardrobe stylist and have them keep this lookbook on file via email and they'll contact you every time they wanna have pieces to put on their clients for their different appearances. So that's something else to consider. And also you can do that, you'll do that with the media too. You'll send your lookbook to the press and they'll hold on to it for any time that there is an opportunity where your jewelry will fit the story that they're working on. Do you know what a lookbook is? Yeah, sorry. Because audience, raise Thank your hand you if you know what a lookbook is. Kind of. Do you want to explain so, that? Yeah, so just a, um, a lookbook is basically a, kind of like a brochure that highlights, so there's lookbook and line sheets. Line sheets are a little bit more on the sales side, so it's a lot of, if you have product, it's showcasing all the product, all the style numbers, maybe the description, the retail or, or wholesale price, and um, where they can contact you if they wanna buy into your collection. Uh, a lookbook is more of a lifestyle element, so something that could go direct to the consumer, but can also be used for the media or press. So you want it to be beautiful, you wanna include, definitely shots of your product, but then also maybe a couple stylized shots or a model wearing it or something to kind of um, draw people in. If you are going to have a brand, especially a jewelry brand, you have to have... You have to have a lookbook. You have to have a lookbook. And you should be updating it... Constantly. Um, yeah. As, as, the more often you can, the better. The good thing is there's so many tools like Canva and things mm -hmm. like that that you can actually do it yourself. Back in the day, you actually had to learn right. Photoshop and all of that fun or stuff. Or you had to spend a lot of money getting a professional to do it for. Yeah, do it but for now you. you can do it. And there's also company, there's things like Barter and Bee, 
where you can actually barter services. So you could gift a piece of your jewelry to a graphic designer and then have them do it. So or a photographer or whatever. But it's it's an investment worth making. You should have a lookbook, and it's something you can house on your website as well. And it's a good sales tool as well, not just for PR and marketing purposes, but for your sales team. Um, and so, just getting back to some some marketing, um, the marketing strategy, experiential events. I don't know how many of you guys know what that is, um, but they're basically creating experiences for the press and for social media influencers that they wouldn't also get on their own. Um, an example of this, so for the past three years, I've been coordinating and producing an event called Mashup LA, where we bring jewelry brands and other types of brands to network with 150 of the best social media influencers, micro and macro social media influencers in a variety of categories over one night. So the brands love this because they don't have to pay a ton of money and they get to interact with so many different social media influencers. And the social media influencers love this because they can network amongst themselves and also meet new opportunities for ambassadorships. So an example in the jewelry world, we had Platinum Guild participated in one of the mashups, and I'll show you a video in a second. But the experience that we created for the social media influencers encouraged them to post on their platforms without having to pay so much money. What we did was we had them bring in jewelry that was worn by top celebrities on the red carpet from the Oscars and Emmys and Globes. And we had all these social media influencers obviously want to try on all this amazing jewelry. And then we also created the world's most expensive manicure made with real platinum and diamonds. So we had a beauty service, Glam Squad, come in and they did these manicures for everybody there, which is what you can see in this photo. Oh, that's Sorry. okay. No, that's okay. Um, you can see an example in the photo there. But it's the idea, and you guys can think about this as your, your, you know, your business is growing, um, what you can do from an experience side to make this more enticing for both the social media influencers and for press to want to talk about you. Um, so we, if you want to see this, it's a very quick video, and it's not just jewelry related, which is what I also wanted, why I also wanted to show it, because it's showing brands coming together. but just to make sure you get your product out there, get it in front of the right people, figure out who your target audience is. Um, and the next, oh, you want to go back? Oh, one, sorry. Sorry. Um, sorry. Okay. I cannot. Two more. It's okay. 
So digital marketing just is another component of Marketing 101. And it's basically the idea of first making sure, are you on the right digital platforms for your target audience? If you need to be on Facebook, be on Facebook. The same thing with Instagram. You should be, everyone should be on Instagram. Um, and are you, are you producing videos? not just regular uh, content on your feeds. And how often are you producing? Are you engaging with your audience? And also, how are you measuring success of your digital marketing campaign? So these are just some of the things to think about with your strategy. Um, and finally, internal company communications. This is a really interesting point because so many times a marketing professional will get you guys press coverage or celebrity product placements, but that's where it ends. Nobody knows that, that certain celebrities are wearing your necklaces, for example. You can get a great photo of Angelina Jolie wearing your necklace, but then what? No one's gonna know that it, you made it. So you need to be able to repurpose this information. PR share it. PR. PR the PR, that's what we say. Make sure you share this information with everyone on your team. Make sure your publicist shares this information with the media. Make sure you post it on social media. I mean, use this information and don't just let it disappear. So I think yeah. that's it for that part. Right. All right, everyone stretch it out. Yeah? We're almost there. Woo, we're almost yeah, there. We're gonna, okay, we're going to talk about business plans. Yeah, woo, okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> so marketing plans, business proposals, like I hear these words, I go, oh, like, uh, sounds like a report, sounds like a test, sounds like something I do not want to do. What I really encourage you to do, if you are, for, even for your personal business and your professional business, you should have a plan, some type of plan but know that your plan can pivot and it can change. So that's why I recommend doing it in Google Docs because then you can access it at any point and on your phone and you can change it as you go. Um, so corporate companies, they all do marketing plans, they do business plans, they do them sometimes many, many years out. For yourself, for your business, if you are looking to get into business, you should have a plan. These are a couple of the elements for your plan. The first thing is um, and this can literally, it doesn't have to be fancy. I'm sure, you know, GIA probably has their own marketing plan. It's very, Shane will probably tell me. It's <laughs> very, um, very comprehensive and very well thought out. For yourself, keep it simple. What are your goals? What do you want to do? Is, is your goal to open five stores, get your e-commerce site up and going, and to grow your Instagram following by 5,000 followers? Okay, if those are your three main marketing goals, then how are you going to reach them? Um, goals can also be called KPIs, key in key performance indicators. Um, you probably hear the term. Sorry, I just call them KPIs, but they are. It's a term that's used often um, for how you measure hitting certain goals. Um, and the main thing with your goals is listing them out and then putting together strategies in order to hit those goals. And your goal should, one, be realistic, um, two, be measurable in some capacity, um, and then three, they should just be targeted to the audience that you're trying to reach, not like, oh, I want to be the next David Yerman. That's a, it's a great lofty goal. It's a big high arching, but maybe for right now is I want to set up an e-commerce shop and showcase my designs and use social media for sales and traffic. That would be more realistic than being like the, a large, global, huge entity that's been building for 50 years, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so setting up your KPIs. The next thing that is so important in the plan is to put a timeline. So that's a calendar. So month by month, how are you going to measure it? So if your goal is to get into a couple more retail stores, well, that might be include you need to exhibit at a show or a trade show or you might want to do a pop-up or something or you plan to go on the road and actually meet with some stores. So you want to make sure that you put in your timeline. If you know that you're going to have a trade show in March, then you know that you're going to need to prepare. So if you're exhibiting at the trade show and you're investing money to be there, you need to make sure that you get that retailer list and that you send out your lookbooks and your line sheets and all of those things and you want to put those in a very strategic way into your thing. So again, you can just go, you know the months of the year, all 12 of them, and you just put bullet points of what you want to accomplish that month that go that lead back to your overarching goals for the year. 
you may not hit all your goals for the year, and that's okay. It's to, that they're really there for you just to benchmark where you're at, but it's just important to put them down. And what you might discover is that you start with one goal of I want to, you know, open five retail stores. Well, you do a couple things that that year to try to get the five retail stores, and what you realize is that you're having significant growth in your online business. So maybe the retail strategy and the retailers you're meeting with, they only wanna do consignment. They don't actually wanna buy into your collection because they're too busy with the other brands. So then you might wanna adapt and you might wanna shift what your priorities are for your company. Um, and then also like just looking at the budget, <laughs> um, you should have a marketing budget. And I know it could start, maybe your marketing budget when you initially go out is $1,000. That's it, that's all you can do for the year. Well, how are you going to use that thousand dollars? How you know? Sometimes it is an investment where you don't see the return, and marketing is one of those things where you often don't see that needle move. Sometimes there is something that's just a, a little gold mine, but a lot of times it's an investment, and it's not like the stock market where like, oh, I see my portfolio going up. Nope, it is something I have to keep doing. But you do start seeing, oh, this is working. This is not working. That kind of thing. Um, so again, being prepared to pivot. I, in addition to you know running an agency and starting my own business, my husband and I own two gyms, um, personal training gyms in Orange County, and he it's like his thing. But I'm there, and we have to pivot all the time because we're local. We're basically a retail establishment. We want people to come in. It doesn't make sense for someone from San Diego to come to our gym because it's way too far. So we're trying to target what we realized is the market that we're in is completely saturated and there's a lot of other gyms in the competition. And so, you know, a couple, like last year, it was all about like the, what was it, like the challenges, like the six week challenge, the burn to fit, blah, blah, blah. We were doing all these Facebook ads and it was working. Then all of a sudden it stopped working. Facebook changed their algorithms and all of these things. So then we pivoted and we've gone into a different direction and we've worked on other strategies that help to bring in people, um, doing some like online things and some communication. So it's really, that's the biggest thing with your marketing plan is that it's adaptive. If you looked at a marketing plan from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five, whatever, you're gonna see that they would change. And also nobody's marketing plan should be exactly the same because every company is unique like yourselves. Um, and then marketing consultation proposals. So when you outline your marketing plan, if there's certain goals you wanna reach, there's probably things in there that you just might not be able to reach on your own and you might need to hire a professional to help you get there. So that's where like Nikki and myself, we specialize in the PR and marketing side. There's people that specialize in website development. There's people, there's graphic designers. There's tons of different types of um, services that you might need. It might be digital advertising. It might be hiring influencers to do, to be brand ambassadors for you. So whatever it is, they do require budget and you have to kind of think, okay, if I have these, these things that I need, so, so my goal is to grow my Instagram. I wanna have a lot more followers. Okay, well then I probably need to do some digital advertising through social media. Well, I don't know a thing about social media advertising. You could try to learn it. It's pretty complex now. So you may wanna hire someone who does specialize in it, who maybe has a small agency and they're doing this day in and day out and they can tell you and guide you. It's an investment, you're gonna to have to pay for it, but at least it helps. Sometimes you learn it on your own. There's plenty of YouTube and all kinds of things to learn on your own. Um, but you have to think about that is when, you hit, when you're looking at your goals, where are the holes? Where are the things that you can do? Because you can't always hit all of them. Um, the other thing is there's a difference between you can hire a freelancer or a consultant to do smaller term projects typically, um, or you know someone who specializes in a certain area, but then you can also hire agencies. Agencies tend to be more expensive because they have higher overhead, but then they have more resources and things like that, like more staff members working on it. Um, the other thing is you may want to bring someone in in-house. So you may find someone that you want to bring in part-time or full-time that can help you. Maybe they wear a couple different hats, but they have some marketing experience. So they might be able to plug a few holes that you need filled for right now. And then eventually as your business grows and you scale a little bit, then you can bring someone else on. So there's no, no 
exact way to do it. It's just to be aware of what your avenues are in terms of um, you know, your, your marketing plans. So hopefully that got you guys jazzed up about getting home, getting your marketing plans together. You're gonna do it. I, I expect to see all of them. Um, <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna um, I, know we have to, I know we have to wrap it up now. I know it's past oh. our time. But gonna, um, so, no. so just briefly, do you want to do yeah. the budget? So um, oh. just briefly, I mean, Jen, the, the next topic was really budget, which Jen briefly talked upon. And the most important part of budget to me is make sure you have one. I can't tell you how many calls I get from potential clients who I ask, well, what is your budget? Well, I don't have a budget. Tell me what it should cost. And then I tell them that it ranges. It's like Jen was saying with a diamond ring. It ranges from very little or not very little to a lot. So make sure you have a budget. Take time to think about what your budget is. And the other thing I want to say about budget is make sure you hire a professional to do it. Don't try to do everything yourself. I know you try in the beginning when you're launching a business to do everything, but even if it means hiring a freelancer who's much less expensive, they don't have that crazy overhead of an agency like Jen mentioned, and they'll, they'll probably be willing to work with you on a shorter term project. So a lot of the agencies will require a one year commitment to stay with them, which can get very costly, especially if they're just starting out. But a freelancer will work with you for three months then give you a one month extension, the price will be less. I would just make sure when you're talking to people, both agencies and freelancers, that you interview them and ask them the right questions. What experience do you have in this field? Have you worked with similar type of clients? Can I see some of the results that you've done? I mean, on Instagram now, it should be easy. You could see results from every, every PR agent and marketing agent, but it's really important to know what experience and what successes they've had um, in order to learn how, if and how they can help you. So that's kind of the takeaway from, from budgeting part. Um, you want to go? Yeah, I mean, that's, we, yeah, we can, we, I know you we can have to wrap it up. But. Do you have any? Um, okay, so just marketing tips. Um, listen to your audience. If they don't, if they're not buying what you want and what you're pushing out there, then you may need to adapt and come up with different or, or just listen. That's really a big, big takeaway. Um, Follow what is happening in the consumer market outside of the jewelry industry, right. what's happening, the disruptors, like how consumers are shopping. And follow your competition. Follow your Definitely comp follow your competition. What are they doing in the marketing space? Mm -hmm. And not to say that you need to emulate because we no. don't need any more copycats, but, mm -hmm. but figure out your own version, but also know what else people are doing. I, I can't tell you how many times I'm like... So who's your competition, or like who in the market? Right. You know who who do your consumers also buy? And they're like, no one. We don't have competition. I'm like that is not true. Every single company has competition, except for like a handful of like the ones that are the first to the market for something. But for the most part, in jewelry, I can I can tell you for a fact there's competition. So just really um, thinking about what that is and and how that affects your business. Um, and then just know change is constant. Um, you know, change used to back in the day, like our you know our parents and blah 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 generations ago, change was a little slower moving. Now it is rapid, fast. It's happening like it could be happening right now. Um, so just knowing that in the back of your head is knowing that you might have to make a change um, sooner than you would anticipate. So that's why you want to keep you know your marketing plans and your budgets fluid mm -hmm. for those opportunities. Um, and then follow up on, on leads, you know, that's like the number one thing. I mean, in our circle PR, all we do, like I, I will send a press release out to all the major media outlets. It will be very well crafted. I've been in the business for 15 years and I won't hear anything back. And then I follow up and then I follow up again. And, and usually, <laughs> usually by that point, it's either nothing or they yeah. say, no, it's a pass or you know what? This is actually great. Can you send me the product mm -hmm. tomorrow? Um, and then just so you know, press coverage, because people are like, oh, if I get featured in Vogue, it's it. I'm done. I've, I've won. The truth is that in, like all things, you can't like Amazon prime your career. You can't Amazon prime your success and growth as a business. You just can't. Sometimes there's situations where like some companies catapult quickly, but every if you listen to any business podcast and you actually hear the behind the scenes, you will know that they've the they have to weather storms constantly. Even the most successful companies out there are constantly 
treading water and figuring out you know what's their next move so as a small business you still need to do that same thing and um, note that if you get a press placement or a celebrity wears it's really about that PR the PR get it out there share it on your social channels utilize that opportunity to say that you have been seen on you you've been featured in use utilize those words but note that that might not move the needles. You might not see this huge growth in sales, but it does help legitimize your brand and it's great for long-term. It's a long-term strategy. And then, um, you know, again, set realistic goals. Um, and then just a couple like quick, you know, we, I think as we were talking, we kind of talked about like successes and failures. Um, I would say, you know, uh, I try to post a couple pictures of successes personally. Um, which, you know, landing a placement for a client in Vogue and Oprah and on Rihanna. I actually was, just so you know, I was on set. This is like a really, this is a long time ago, it was like 10 years ago, but Rihanna was doing a cover shoot with, um, for Essence Magazine, and they needed, I had a client that had watches, and they were, it was all diamond encrusted, and then you clicked it, and the time went through, um, which was super cool, and it was really, like, it was so fun to pitch it out, and so I brought it to the set, because it was really high value. And then they were like, oh, we don't know how to put the watch on. And they're like, jewelry girl, come here, put the watch on her. And she's like standing there and all her makeup team. And I'm like trying to do it. And I'm, I'm like shaking and Rihanna's like, just put the watch on me. And I'm like, I don't even know how to put the watch on her. So like, that's when I learned how to put on watches. <laughs> and I was like shaking. And then she's like, I love this watch, I want it. And I was like, I'll talk to your people. We'll, we'll make yeah, it happen. That's the best. So, when you sell product, I've done that too. When I've loaned product to celebrities, and they're like, "I want these earrings." Yeah, yeah that's that's. My we didn't skill. sell it. We loaned it for her, and she wore it for like a while, yeah. and got some pictures, and then you know, and then she gave it back. But yeah. it was fun, and um, you know, there's like there's been a lot of like highs like that. Um, but then there's also been like you know some really like tough moments where right. we thought we were gonna secure something and. You know, last year had uh, actually something in Vogue that was, they were in for Oprah's gift guide, and I was like, come on, let's make the list, and then they both got cut, yeah. and they didn't and make happened. the final gift guide. So that's a big part of my job is disappointment, so it's the outlook and trying to be positive, mm -hmm. positive and forward-thinking. Right. And, and just keep going until you get the yes. It's going to yes. happen. Some, <laughs> some, someone said, like, <laughs> they said yes is a lazy no, so oh, that's good. I like um, that. you can, you know... No Oh, wait, no is a lazy yes. Sorry. Yes, no is a lazy yes. Um, yeah. don't, don't quote me. Yeah. But, um, we'll end on the successes. Yeah, so we'll end on successes. <laughs> and if you want to ask us about failures or if the <laughs> online community wants to ask right. us about failures, we are happy to talk about failures. We're very transparent. Um, so thank you. Yeah. And then our last slide actually is the one, this is the one to take a picture of. If yes. you can read it, hopefully yeah. our font isn't too small. But we just wanted to give you guys some helpful tips and resources. Um, I know this is, you want me to just go? Because I talk fast. I talk really fast sometimes. So, because um, I want to make sure we have time for questions. So, um, tools, Cision. Have you heard of Cision? Uh, Cision is a database that basically every single um, marketing, marketing and, and professional uses, and it basically Rolodexes all the journalists out there. It's subscription based and it's expensive, um, and that's why a lot of times you want to hire a professional that already has a subscription, be, and then they already have the contacts in place. But um, Cision actually offers a lot of workshops and like a lot of free resources, and they have a great blog. So that's why we wanted to mention it to you. Um, project tracker apps are really great um, nowadays. If it works for you, Monday, Slack, HoneyBook, um, there's all different types, but you got to figure out what works for your. There's Trello. There's like other ones. Um, websites, obviously, use LinkedIn. Um, PR Couture, Girl Boss now has, if you're a female, um, entrepreneurs and, and all kinds of, they have their own version of LinkedIn, um, which is great. There's um, other websites like Create and Cultivate, there's Simply Inc, um, and, and also all the jewelry trade magazines, and like JCK Online, National Jeweler, In-Store. Those are really important just to know what's happening at WWD. Those aren't on there. Um, you can always just DM me afterwards. We'll give you my. Uh, we'll give you our contacts. But if there's anything you had a question on, um, I won't name yeah, all of the the, the the podcast. But this podcast. podcasts are amazing. I will do a shout out because I love Second Life. Uh, oh, is 
This Second is Life the best. is amazing. It's the best. <laughs> it's about career changes, making leaps. Um, and and it time. was game changing. And actually, I reached out to Hillary to say how much I loved it. And Hillary's the host, and she's also the founder of um, Who What Where. Where. And she and I have like had multiple conversations via DM, and she's been a huge supporter. So, so I you never know who you respond. Who yeah, responds to you just don't DM. know. Okay. Um, and then Facebook communities. There's tons of them. So just Google or Facebook them, and you'll find them um, and join them, and you know, unjoin them if they're not fun or they're weird. But. Um, <laughs> And then networking just, and education. Yeah, networking and education. So 24 Karat Club, there's a group called BNI, and I, um, the alumni group here. Mm -hmm. Come to the career fair, that's in October. It's such a huge valuable. There's career mentoring, um, uh, career coaching, which is incredible. They always have great, brilliant speakers. So um, we are done um so these are our contacts feel free to reach out um if you want to connect with us afterwards um i forgot my business card so don't even ask but it's just, all digital nowadays yeah so i can you we can take a picture i have one card. so um so thank you everybody yeah. this has been so much fun yeah really appreciate thank it thank you and thank you for having Facebook. us gia <laughs> so do we want to do some good questions questions yeah. and comments any questions there's one from Facebook. All right. Is it from my mom? <laughs> or my husband. <laughs> okay, so we have one from Kings Jewelry and Loan. Um, the question is, what if we follow competition and they take our customers on our feed? Um, so, I mean, you you don't own any followers at the and end of the day. And followers come and go. It's important to know that too. Yeah. So, so. our our question or the question of, of your competitors now stealing your potential clients and things like that, you just don't have control over it. It's just one of those things that's social media is an open market. So I think um, you don't necessarily have to follow, like actually click and follow so that they know. You can just, um, or you can set up a fake account and then you can follow <laughs> all the people that you don't want to know no. that you follow. Yeah. Um, just to see what's happening, but not necessarily like let them see your brand. Um, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, I, I think too. I mean, you really, the whole idea of getting a following base is to keep them engaged. And so, it doesn't matter if they follow other jewelry brands, make yours one that they want to continue following and not unfollow you. And do more inter do interesting things on Instagram, I mean, in Insta stories. You can do contests, you can do some offer trips and experiences or any kind of interesting opportunities. Okay. Um, the other one is a longer question oh. from Nikki. Um, and it's basically just um, to summarize it is a lot of, um, Consumers, especially the younger generation, are wearing jewelry less, um, or they're wearing, they're not necessarily looking for fine jewelry. And I think it's kind of, um, you know, how do you connect with them? And I, I think that at the end of the day, I mean, the younger generation, which I would, I'm kind of in it, but a little bit one step above it, I'm in the, I'm in the middle somewhere. Uh, I, I straddle the line of millennial and I don't know, not boomer, but um, I would say, you know, they do. I think the thing is with um, brands is that you have to, one, if you're a retail store, then you need to make it experiential. Right. To do, to be the, the old school kind of, you know. Just traditional. Traditional. Trunk shows. Traditional trunk shows aren't always the answer anymore. Do so, if you're doing a trunk show, I would say do something interesting in your store. Offer I, I'm, offer them to have um, ear a Hollywood piercing. experience or ear piercing, and yeah, ear piercing, ear piercing party. Or um, there's a really great or, retailer in Brooklyn called Catbird, and they mm -hmm. do um, they like henna tattoos. they do henna tattoos. They do, uh, they do like a link, and it's called I think I, I, I'm gonna butcher the name, but they they connect the link so that you go in and you buy this little chain, and then you can never take it off. So it's just a little tiny delicate chain, but it's and it sits there perfectly on 
on there, but it brings people in. And I think it's know. all about creating these interesting experiences, like we mentioned. You know, partnering with a local artist and and mm -hmm. and utilizing some of their clients who appreciate art and design yes, and very. things like that. I think it's just important to connect. I don't think the market may have um, become more narrow and yet more players in the market, mm -hmm. so it's saturated. So if you are launching a business, there are a lot of competition. But I think but it's it, just, again, it brings you back to marketing. Yeah. You know, what are you doing in the marketing space to set you apart? Yep. And you don't have to reach everyone. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's really just to get that core customer and to invite them to come. Um, I, um, any other questions from the audience? Okay, uh, gentlemen. So I had a question about disruptors and how, as a founding company, do you guys have worked with that mm -hmm. can be entry disruptors or something to sort of accelerate entry? And I guess, uh, I guess, Sure. So the question is disruptors and any um, examples of disruptors within the jewelry industry or ones that we've worked with. I have one I can I mean, start with. You could start with your, yeah. So one is, it's not a traditional type of jewelry product, but it's, um, I worked in, it was in a few of the slides, but a company called Gem Water, um, which was gemstone um, infused water bottles. And it was a product that was mostly sold in salons and spas and things like that, but in kind of in the wellness community, but it n never really touched the jewelry community. So the um, founder of the company, Alan Jeanette, she decided to hit it to the jewelry industry because she came from the jewelry industry. And so she started going out to all these retailers and they started adding the, the gem water bottles and the gem products into their customer experience. So when customers would go into a store like London Jewelers, they were being served gem water products, um, or you know, in a in a beautiful glass with uh, little you know all these different things. So Neiman Marcus started doing it. Neiman Marcus was like looking into. I don't know if I should be like dropping all the names, but but um, sure. retailers <laughs> retailers were utilizing that in their in their space, and they found that it was a, such a perfect tie of a gifting type of jewelry related item, partnering that with traditional jewelry. Right. So I wouldn't say it's like oh my gosh, revolutionary and, disruptor, but it disrupted and it gave actually a different business and a stream of revenue for those those stores and it gave their customers a cool experience and something that they could right. take away and purchase. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the specific jewelry designer or design. It could be something that they're doing that's unique in the space too. Because for example, when I first started in this business, hardly anyone was doing celebrity placement. It was more like all we cared about were magazines. We didn't care about celebrities and nowadays influencers. So, for example, the clip that you saw with Platinum Guild participating in a mashup event, it's like they're getting exposed now. All these designers who are producing Platinum product are getting exposed to influencers that otherwise they would have never been exposed to. And all these social media influencers now know about Platinum Jewelry. So there's different ways, um, even, if, even if specific designs aren't so original or unique in the space, to do something special. And I, I think technology is probably the wave. Um, one thing we were talking about at lunch was there is a company out there that's allowing companies to rent jewelry. So fine jewelry. It's fine jewelry. So it's the simil the concept of rent the runway, but it's with fine jewelry. Mm -hmm. And they're bringing on brand partners in, an or in order to do that, which is great and smart for those brands that are participating. Yes, it might be slight risk and they don't know and they may not get that piece back because who knows, you know, as they're testing the market with this, the, the concept of returning and, and, you know, kind of the Netflix of, the original Netflix of, um, you know, what, what is that? I forget what the type of business that's called, but um, there, you know, as a brand, it's a really great way to expose yourself to a new audience. It might not be your biggest money generator for you as a company, but I might be a user and I borrow a pair of your earrings and I love them so much and they just work so well that I might actually go out and purchase mm -hmm. those earrings. So I think just kind of looking for those kind of disruptive um, mm -hmm. business models. The other thing, I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about the in-home service, the Glam Squad. Um, the CEO was speaking on a on a on a podcast and she was saying like that's the future people 
we're so fast paced and we, but we want now people, we want our doctors, we want our, our beauty hair makeup to come into our home and do it because we're so busy and so crunch, pressed for time. Um, so, you know, in the, you know, with jewelry, that's, there's not an app right now out there. Maybe I'm, maybe I should be there. Maybe I should, <laughs> should develop it. I don't know. But you know, there's not an app that's you. like building a community of jewelry loving people who want to borrow and they, but they want to meet with a personal jeweler in order to do it. Yes, you can go to a retailer absolutely and you can find the perfect jeweler to create a piece but there isn't any like in home service but like that is the way that you know the generation is going is convenience um so we have one more question do we have anyone in the audience um i don't see any questions on here um anything else well, we would like to thank you, thank you for everybody. coming, staying. And for staying. Yeah, and Perfect. hopefully you get some sun after this and enjoy and your time. Hopefully you enjoyed the presentation. Yeah. Some interesting insights. Yeah, so if you have any questions, you can DM us, you can email, email. us, you could snail mail us, but I'm not going to give you my address. So don't do that. Um, you <laughs> or can, talk to us in person. You can do a live I IRL. Right. So um, thank you, all, everyone. Thank you for so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, GIA. Thank you, GIA. Yes. Yeah. There's always more than meets the eye.